Well, good morning, church family. Uh, just so y'all know, that was uh, Ron and Lene Sanders' daughter, June. Uh, we got a lot of Rons. Uh, we're filthy with Chris's and, and David's, and sometimes you got to put that last name on there. But uh, but that's who uh, that's the Ron Ron Sanders and Lene, their their uh, daughters. So let's keep her in our prayers. Uh, yesterday, uh, Karen and I uh, got to spend a really awesome time uh, up in Longs, uh, South Carolina, just uh, I guess uh, west of North Myrtle Beach. Uh, uh, the McDonald's, Larry and uh, Sam McDonald, their son Malik, uh, got to do his wedding yesterday. Um, so he married Hannah Long, and it was a great ceremony, great time, like beautiful weather, a little bit of wind, uh, but it was a beautiful time. And so if you see Larry and Sam uh, in the coming weeks, congratulate them. I just married off their son to, to a wonderful girl. And I tell you, when I did the premarital counseling with them, uh, there is a couple that just took it so seriously. I loved it. And, and when, I, when I told them, hey, this is our last session, on the last night we did it, she actually, I, Hannah actually said, aw. <laughs> And I was like, well, we can keep going if you want, but you know, I, I think you guys are good. So uh, that's the kind of attitude that I love. Um, so we're going to start a new series this morning in the book of Ruth. Um, and I've never really taught extensively out of this book, uh, so I'm really excited about this opportunity to really dive deep into this over the next few weeks. Um, I, I'm just excited about it. Growing up, though, I, I always wondered, I don't know if you, every time I heard Ruth, I just wondered what she did wrong. Right? Because I kept hearing Joshua judges Ruth, and uh, I don't know what Ruth did, but apparently Joshua didn't like it, and um, I really did think that as a kid. I'm serious. Um, but Ruth is, is placed behind judges at the, uh, in, in our English Bible and in the Septuagint because uh, this story is set during the time of the judges. In fact, that's the very first thing we hear in the story, the very first thing we're told. Right? Very in first one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. And if you kind of hear there, in a galaxy far, far away, or once upon a time, right? Or in a certain kingdom, right? It's, it's, it's that kind of language. And it's, it's, it's setting up the fact that this is a narrative. The whole, the whole story is just a narrative. Four chapters. I really encourage you over the next month or so to, to read through Ruth once a week at least. Um, get familiar with this if, this if you're not familiar with this story, but there's so much in it uh, for us to talk about. But I think it's important for us to remember when this story took place. It happened in the time of the judges. And the time of the judges for, um, getting ahead of me already, the, the time of the judges for, for Israel, it was a, a, character, it was a roller coaster ride, right? It was a roller coaster ride for the Israelites. Um, God had set himself up after giving them, you know, the, 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 the promised land. He had set for himself up as their king. That's how it was supposed to work. That's how God wanted it to be. He gave them priests. He gave them a law of sacrifices and, 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 and all laws and holy days. But he was supposed to be their king. But Israel very rarely, unfortunately, would follow those laws. Their loyalty to him as their king was anything but constant. They were like a bad boyfriend or a bad girlfriend, right? Madly in love one moment, just promising you the moon, and the next thing they're turning and they're flirting with every other person that comes along, swiping through Tinder, right, left and right. They cheated with every foreign god in the vicinity. They uh, dabbled in pagan rituals and sacrifices uh, and, and many terrible things that went, went so much against God's law. They often ignored God's law and the fact that he was supposed to be their king. And they didn't like that. So we easily discern, see, in, in the book of Judges, there's this pattern that emerges, and I'm, I'm not the first one to notice it. It's been noticed for, for a long, long time here. When things would go well for a while, the people would start to fall away from God. They would start to follow other practices. Their worship, their sacrifice would diminish, and they would begin to set up idols. They would begin to worship other gods. And then God would be patient with that for a while, and then eventually God got tired of it. And he would pull away his protection and his blessing over them. And pretty soon they would have enemies coming in, harassing them, stealing their food, taking their women and children, taking their land, or famine would come to the land and there'd be a drought. Finally, when things got bad enough, the Israelites would call out to God. They'd say, God, please come and save us. And God would. He would listen to them. He would hear their cries and he would respond by usually raising up a judge. Right? That's why the book is called Judges. He would raise up a judge to, to defeat the enemies or do whatever needed to be done to help save the people 
from what was happening. And so this would lead to a period of prosperity as that judge led for a period of time, sometimes long, sometimes short. And then again, the, the cycle would just repeat and repeat and repeat over and over again. And you, you, you read through it, and you just wonder, why didn't they learn their lesson? Why, why does this keep happening over and over again? Right? When they started to go through the cycle again of abandoning God, you just wonder, why is no one speaking up and warning them? You see, that period of Israel's history, though, it started with the death of Joshua's generation. Joshua was that great leader who took after Moses, right, who led them into land and finally conquered it after going through the, the wilderness for so long. And so we read in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, so a verse that to me just sums up the whole problem of why Judges happens, why this pattern emerges. After that whole generation, it says, had been gathered to their ancestors, so again, that generation of Joshua, the ones who conquered Canaan, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You want to get into a bad cycle? That's how you do it. You don't teach the next generation what God has done for you and for your ancestors. And they don't hear that. And when they don't hear that, then they don't follow God. And when things start to go bad, they don't even cry out to him. And this cycle begins to happen. And so it's during this cycle that Ruth, the story of Ruth happens. It's towards the end, I think, because it's not long before God gave in to their demands for an earthly king. They wanted an earthly king. And God finally gave in to that. But that's about when Ruth takes place. It's right before that. And so this was, just for the context, this was a tumultuous time. This was a rebellious time. It was a roller coaster for other people. But we also see that it wasn't a great time for Ruth and her in-laws, was it either? A famine had come to Judah. This was not uncommon because the irrigation was, was, was very difficult in the, in the land of Judah. And so when the rain didn't fall, the crops didn't grow. That's just how it was. And so it got really bad. And so we see that it's um, this man from Bethlehem, Elimelech, takes his wife, Naomi, and their sons, Mahlon and Kilian, and they leave from Moab. Moab was just east of Israel, on the other side of the Dead Sea, and apparently things may have been a little bit better there. But this family lived in such a difficult time during a famine, and their prospects had become so bad that they, they made this decision that they would go live in a foreign land. That they would leave behind the promised land and they would go to a place that worshipped idols. A place that was not following God. And before we even hear any more of the story, we're already foreshadowing. There's already been a foreshadowing and you didn't catch it. Okay, but it happened. You remember when you, see, remember when you watch a movie and, the, and all of a sudden you hear the music start and you're like, oh, something bad's about to happen, right? You know someone's about to die or some bad guy's fixing to show up. Right? This, is, this has already happened in the story, you just didn't know it. Because, see, names are a really important part of the story of Ruth. Really important. And it starts, the story starts off with two great names, Elimelech and Naomi. I loved it so much, I named one of my daughters, Naomi. It means, which means, my God is king. Elimelech means, my God is king. And Naomi means, pleasant or delight. Now, it's interesting that, one of the, that the man's name is, my God is king. When this is a time when the Israelites were rejecting God as their king. But those are two great names. It starts off really well, but then it goes south pretty quickly. Their son's names are Bachlan and Kilian, which mean sickness and destruction. <laughs> now, you've heard some bad baby names in your life, I'm sure. My wife's a teacher. She's heard tons of them. But that, I mean, come on. Who names their kids sickness and destruction? That's what they named them. And sure enough, in the very next verse, we find out that Elimelech dies while they're in Moab, which is bad enough, but at least Naomi still had sons, right? She still had two sons that could provide for her and take care of her. And they married two Moabite women that we find out, Orpah and Ruth. And then they, they have a, a few years go by, and then, of course, just like we see it coming, sickness and destruction die, right? Mahlon and Kilian die. And now Naomi is left with no male relative around her, in a foreign land, and with two foreign daughters-in-laws to take care of. But she hears something. Some good news comes her way, at least. Right? And all that badness that's happening, at least something good happens. She hears that God has provided once again back in Judah. That God is moving in his land. 
The text says this in particular. It says, The Lord had come to the aid of his people, which should immediately make us think about that cycle, right? That cycle of disobedience, punishment, salvation. This is that portion where God is beginning to move again. He's beginning to act again. He's bringing the rain. He's bringing the food back to his people. He is saving them once again. And Naomi hears about this. And so she decides to return to her homeland. And what we see next, and what we're going to talk about this morning, are two different conversations that she has that reveal just how low she's been brought down, just how bad she sees her plight and her tragedy and her grief. We're going to talk about these two pieces of these conversations, um, and we're going to talk about other pieces. We're not going to cover, obviously, all of Ruth in one sermon. We're We're going to take it piece by piece. But this morning, we're going to talk about Naomi. And it's very interesting that the book is called Ruth, because it really could very easily be called Ruth and Naomi, or Naomi and Ruth. Because both these women are so important to this story. But we're going to look at Ruth chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and then verses 20 and 21. So the first kind of conversation that she has is with her daughters-in-law. Naomi's trying to convince them to to go go back home, right? Go back to Moab. Go back to your families that you came from. Right? And so she says this. She says, return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight... And I gave birth to sons, right? She says, even if if there was a man right here for me to be my husband, and I got pregnant tonight, and and nine months later I had sons, you're going to wait for them to grow up to be your husbands? I can't can't provide for you what you need, she says. Would you wait till they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? You see where her focus is? She says, I'm too old to have another husband and raise new sons. There's no hope for me any longer. But for you, my daughters, there, there is still hope. You're still young. You still can go back to your home. You can find other husbands. So she goes on. She says, no, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. And listen to what she says. The Lord's hand has turned against me. It is so difficult in times of tragedy and grief for us to think that God is on our side any longer, isn't it? When you are in this place where your heart is broken as Naomi's was in this moment, where you see no hope It's hard to see that God is on your side. When hope has left us, it feels as if God has left us. And I'm sure that many of you have felt that way in your life at times. But Naomi tells us more. She returned to Bethlehem. She gets back home to her small town, and the whole town perks up with the news, right? And if you've ever lived in a small town, I grew up in a small town, about 3,000, where everybody knew what everyone else was doing, right? So when someone shows back up, everybody hears about it real quick. And so the, everyone's a buzz that, that, that Naomi is back. And one of the women in the town, they can't believe that she's come. And so they say, they say is that you, Naomi? And here's, here's her reply. She says, don't, don't call me Naomi. That's not my name anymore. You can't call me that. Call me Mara. Right? You hear what she's saying? She says, don't call me pleasant. Don't, don't call me a delight any longer. Call me bitterness. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. She said, just call me bitter from now on. Right? Because God has made me that way. And here's, she goes on to say this, and this, this is just heartbreaking. I went away full. Listen to that. I went away with sons and a husband and hope. But the Lord has brought me back empty. I have none of that anymore. Why call me Naomi? Why call me a delight? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. You, you hear where Naomi is, don't you? I'm this place of utter despair, utter hopelessness. And we could look at that and we could think that maybe Naomi's just being a little dramatic here, right? But you've been in her shoes. Many of us have been in her shoes. Have you ever been in a place where you've t- your life has taken such an awful turn for you that you think, you know what, I might as well just change my name because nothing will ever be the same. I'll never be the same person I once was. So I might as well change my name because I'm never going to recover from this. What would you have changed your name to in that moment? Just call me lonely from now on? Just call me unfulfilled? Call me fired, call me divorced, call me rejected. My new name is not what it once was. You see, Naomi identifies with her sorrow and with her grief in such a way that she says, I can't be called the same anymore. 
And we might see that her words also, that, that maybe she's blaming God, right? That that's what's happening here. She's saying, God, this is all your fault. God, I mean, after all, she's saying, God has turned his hand against me. He's afflicted me and brought me misfortune. He saw me full and he emptied me out. All that's left now in me is bitterness. But what I think we see in Naomi's story at this moment, where we're at in the story, is not blame. It's the beginning of the cycle, the pattern of God's restoration. It's the crying out. Naomi was voicing her complaint out in the open to God. She was saying, God, you have done this to me. It's not much different than what we read in so many other parts of the Old Testament. This is lament, is what it is. And we don't talk hardly at all about lament. I still remember a preacher once time telling me, you know, it's interesting how many churches have praise teams. No one has a lament team, right? Everybody wants to praise God and sing joy, but what, what about when we're sad? What about when we're grieving? What about having, putting a team together for that? The Jews had that. Every time we read in Jesus' in Jesus's stories, right? every time someone dies, there's people showing up to mourn, right? A lot of times they didn't even know the person. They were good at it. We're not always so great at that. Lament. But we see this all over the Old Testament and in the New, especially in the Psalms and, and of course, the book of Lamentations. There's a whole book that named, named after that. And the prophets about it, it's all over the prophets as well. So, for instance, in Lamentations 2.17, it says this. It says, The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago, which may sound like a good setup, but it's not. He says, He has overthrown you without pity. He has let the enemy gloat over you, and he has exalted the horn that is the strength of your foes. God has afflicted his people. Psalms 80, verses 4 through 6 say this, How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? I thought God listens to prayers. Now his anger is smoldering against it. You have fed them, listen to this, this he is, you have fed them with the bread of tears and you've made them drink tears by the bowlful. He said, God, all you're giving us to eat and drink is tears. That's how bad it's gotten. We don't have anything to eat but tears. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. We are without friend in this world. This is the people of God that we're talking about. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, the Lord declares this. This is the Lord speaking. He says, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies, which you might think he's talking about the enemies of Israel again. It's not what he's talking about. He says, I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away all your dross. He is talking to the leaders, the shepherds of Israel. God does afflict his people. We cannot be ignorant about that. God does turn his hands against those he loves at times. Naomi was in such, not so much blaming God as she was recognizing that so much has been taken away from her in such a tragic way, and she was at the bottom of the pit. Now, the text does not tell us that this happened to her family because of sin. It doesn't say that. And I don't want to put that in there if it's not there. But we do know this. When things got really bad for Limelech and his family, what did they do? Instead of suffering along, their fellow, with, along with their fellow Israelites, they went to a foreign land. They left the promised land of their people. They went to a place of idol worship. And they married their sons off to foreign women, which we know God did not, was not pleased with. Now, God worked with that. And we're going to talk about that as we read through the story of Ruth. God works with this. But repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, we see again this familiar cycle. People abandon God. God afflicts the people. The people cry out. And God brings restoration. That is where Naomi is in this chapter. She's in that cycle of crying out to God. And God's going to listen. God's going to hear her. Yes, things have gone awful for Naomi. She is in the pit. But God is going to hear her. And when you know it, restoration is just around the corner for her. Naomi's fortunes are going to change and change dramatically. Her delight had become bitterness, but her bitterness was going to become delight again. And so, at the end of the story of Ruth, this bitter woman, Mara, right, has reclaimed her original name. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, has found a husband, 
right? This redeemer, Boaz, has come along, and Ruth has given birth to a son. But the women don't cry out, Ruth has a son. They cry out, Naomi has a son. Naomi has a son. Look what God has done in Naomi's life. His name, is, oh, his name was Obed, and he was the grandfather of King David. You see, lament has turned into praise for Naomi. And the women said to Naomi this, they said, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. Now think about that for a second. They're saying, Naomi, because of what God has done in your life, in your personal life, may God become more famous because of that. Did you know that God became famous because of you? You think, well, God, how can God become more famous? Because when people hear what he's done in your life, right, his fame spreads. And that's what they're saying here. They're saying, Naomi, God's done such an amazing thing in your life that he's going to become even more famous. People are going to hear this story. You see, this story of this book of Ruth is the story of restoration. That's what it's all about. God never says a word in the entire book. He doesn't even really show up hardly at all. We don't, we don't see him move in a particular way, at least not, not, not delineated that way, which makes it a very unusual book in that regard. But it's a story about how restoration came to a family and to a woman. Because restoration is what God does. It is his business. He loves restoring things. We get to see God's amazing restoration play out in this particular family. So we read those three passages earlier, right? That spoke of God's hand turning against his people. But every single one of those passages comes in the context of restoration as well. If we look back at the verses around of Psalm 80, we find that those verses we read, they are ringed with twin verses that say the exact same thing. They just repeat themselves. They say, restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we might be saved. The psalm ends with those exact same words. Restoration. In the midst of the despair and the crying out, they're still saying, God, we believe you will restore us. In Isaiah, which is a book so full of judgment and accusations against the God's people, it also includes restoration. And you don't have to wait till chapter 40 and following to get there. The verse that we read just after the ones we read earlier, 24 and 25, well, 26 says this, I will restore your leaders as in the days of old your rulers, as at the beginning. Afterwards, you will be called a city of righteousness, a faithful city. So God says, I'm going to purge you, but here's what I'm also going to do. I'm going to restore you. Even in the book of Lamentations, which again is all about lament, about mourning, about bitterness, we see glimpses of God's restoration even in that book. In chapter 3, verses 55 and 58, it says this, I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit, you heard my plea. Here was the plea. Do not close your ears to my cry of relief. God, listen to me. God, hear me. God, when I am grieving, please do not be deaf to me. But here was God's his response. He said, you came near when I called you. So first of all, God drew near. But also, here's what he said. Do not fear. Do not fear. Your Lord, you, Lord, took up my case. And you redeemed my life. You see, even in the midst of affliction and grief and tragedy, the Bible says God is still working to restore. And those are just three examples. We could spend a lot more time. We could spend all day going over this, talking about how these things are so mixed in Scripture. Time and again, when God's people are afflicted, when things are not going their way, whether it's by His hand, right, or not, God is standing there poised to bring about restoration. He is just waiting, chomping at the bit to make things right again. And that probably doesn't surprise us because God is a good God. But what might surprise us is that God plans out the restoration before the affliction even happens. God's already planned it out before it even is necessary. We see this very clearly. This last passage, we'll look at it at the end of Deuteronomy. At the end of Deuteronomy, God is laying out his law for his people. He's telling them, if you follow my laws, here's the good that's going to happen. If you disobey, here's the bad that's going to happen. He's crystal clear. It's a very clear lesson to God's people. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what I'm going to do. And in chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, he says this. He says, when all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, right? In other words, when I do what I say I'm going to do, right? 
when I say when I do what I say I'm going to do, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, according to everything I've commanded you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. God, as he delivers his law to his people, as he starts this relationship with them, he says, I know you're going to fail at this. I know you're going to need this. And I'm already planning out your restoration. I'm already working on it. I've already got it in my mind. I know you'll disobey. I know you're going to have to face the consequences, but I'm going to plan out how to bless you when you return to me, when you come back to me. And again, we see this all over Scripture. Well, what's awesome in this book of Ruth is we get to see it play out in the life of Naomi, a particular specific woman. We get to see that God did restore her and how he did it. And this is going to be the main theme of this series is restoration. But we're going to look at those pieces that took place that made that restoration possible. But what I want you to hear this morning is that God is a God of restoration. That he's already planned it for you. So if you're sitting here thinking, God, I don't know what you're doing in my life. I, I, I need you to, to, to fix things. Things have gone so bad. God said, I'm already working on it. I've already been working on it. Don't worry. I've got this. This is what I do. I do it in the lives of, of nations. I do it in the lives of individuals. Right? If you're looking for restoration this morning, and if you need it in your life in whatever way, I hope that you listen to what God is going to teach us through the story of Ruth and Naomi. But of course, this story is a microcosm of God's great plan of restoration. For all of creation, he wants to restore everything. From the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, God planned to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of all humanity, because he knew we would need it. He planned to allow us to be restored to him, to bring, be brought back into relationship with him, to be reconciled, and not just us, but all of creation. Again, before any of us were born, God already worked out how to save us and restore us by sending us our Redeemer. We're going to talk about what a Redeemer is in this series, but our Redeemer, our salvation is Jesus Christ. God has already worked out your restoration. He's already got it in mind. He's just waiting for you to come back to him, to return to him, to put your faith in him, to say, God, I'm with you. I'm ready for it. God will work it out. I can't tell you when. God's timing is not our timing, but he will restore you. It will happen. If not in this life, then in the next. But I believe he restores in this life, and that's what Naomi tells us. That's what this story tells us. If you need restoring this morning, then the first step in doing that is coming back to God, is returning to God, and you say, well, I never was with God. Well, yeah, you were. You were always God's. You just need to come back to him. Be restored to him first. That relationship is where restoration happens. Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you could be baptized into his death and resurrection and walk a new life with him. Be washed of your sins. If you need that this morning, we pray that you'd come. If you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if we can be a part of helping you be restored, because we're going to see in this story that Naomi's restoration happened through people. Right? And that's one of the greatest things that I love about this story is we get to be a part of this restoration for others at times. And that's so cool. That's so amazing. If we need to help you with that, please come. If you need anything at all, as we stand and as we sing.